Christ is among us. <clears throat> I'm Father Justin, joining you from my study here at St. George in Birmingham. Those of us who are here at St. George have as our religious ed program for the year, um, the uh, program called The Way. And The Way integrates the God With Us series of um, that our diocese and the other Byzantine Catholic dioceses around the United States have developed, <clears throat> but also uh, a variety of other um, resources in seven themes or pillars. And so this month, the month of October, we look at the Divine Liturgy. Part of the packet that will be going out this afternoon to all of our families, and if those of you who are watching uh, do not receive this packet of uh, religious ed materials, please um, don't hesitate to contact St. George and we can um, get it, make it available to you. There's an excellent presentation by one of our parishioners, Rose Ritchie, um, on the liturgy, very, very detailed. And so in my little talk to kind of provide some orientation and some perspective on the overall topic for the month, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the spirituality of the liturgy. Um, that for us, you know, when we come to church, we are entering into a moment and an in, spa in a space of encounter. <clears throat> that you know, God can be present to us and is present to us all the time, but it's a special um, moment when we celebrate the Divine Liturgy, when I say, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we're talking about that present moment, not the future where the kingdom will be fully revealed, not the past when we know all the wonderful deeds that God has done for us, but right then in that moment. And so even more than just being able to pray in our icon corners or um, pray in nature or wherever else we might um, spend time in, in prayer, the, the celebration of the divine liturgy brings together the priestly people of God to encounter God in a very powerful way <clears throat> in the holy mystery of, of the Eucharist and in the holy the mystery of his word um, present among us. So the liturgy is a theophany. The word theophany means revelation of God. And so the, the feast of the church year that we call theophany uh, is on January 6th, the baptism of Jesus. And in that moment in the Gospels, and all four of the Gospels have um, this re recount the, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, God, the Father's voice, affirms Jesus' sonship, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes and rests upon him. And so for the first time in the New Testament, we see the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there are other theophanies in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, when Moses encounters the burning bush, and then later encounters God himself giving the law on Mount Sinai, those two moments are theophanies, where God is present. Um, God comes and, and, and breaks through into the world so that we can encounter him. Besides the baptism of Jesus, we also can say in the New Testament that the Feast of the Transfiguration, where Jesus takes his closest three apostles up on the mountain and is transfigured, shows forth his true divinity, um, which they perceive as divine light, that is so profound that it blows them away. And, and Moses and Elijah appear with him showing that he's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Once Jesus has suffered and died and risen from the dead, two of his disciples um, encounter him on the road to Emmaus. And Luke and Cleopas are the names of the disciples. They don't recognize him until the breaking of the bread, right? And so he explains the scriptures to them on the road and they are, um, their hearts burn within them for, with yearning for God. And then he fulfills that 
by breaking the bread. And he disappears, but they have the Eucharist. Christ is present with them, and they encounter him. They, they have a moment uh, of theophany that, that, that God has revealed to them. And so in the Eucharist, in the Word, uh, and in the Holy Mystery, the sacramental mystery, we have an encounter with God, a tangible, perceivable encounter with God that doesn't depend upon our feelings. I mean, sometimes, hopefully, we have a very profound experience of God, but sometimes we don't. You know, sometimes, you know, we're not in a place just like Luke and Cleopas were when they first encountered Jesus. They were so overwhelmed by what had happened. They weren't, they weren't seeing Jesus, even though he was standing and talking to them. Um, and so sometimes in our lives, too, we, we just can't perceive God present in our lives. Uh, and, it, and it's in his word and in the holy mysteries, the sacramental mysteries, that we can have confidence that even if we don't feel him, even if it's not heavy, deep, and real for us, that Christ is present in our lives, that the power of the Holy Spirit is active um, and, and working within us. So we can see the liturgy in many different ways. We can think about the liturgy in many different ways. <clears throat> the word liturgy itself, liturgia, means the work of the people. And so Sometimes people will say to me, oh, Abuna, I love your liturgy. I love the way you, you, you celebrate the liturgy. But I'm not the only celebrant of the liturgy. We are all celebrants of the liturgy. And I serve it for you. I serve it. I'm present. I gather all of our prayers at the altar, which is part of my ministry as a priest. But all of us are the priestly people of God because of our baptism. And so... The liturgy is our work. I love the fact that here at St. George, we all sing, right? That, that we're not just listening to a choir sing. And, you know, because sometimes what happens is you can become spectators rather than concelebrants of the liturgy, right? You're not coming to a show. You're not coming to a play. You're not coming to a movie. Although in these days with, you know, with our live streaming, it may seem a little more like that. Um, it's... It's truly the work of the people. And we have people who are trained in music uh, and in the celebration of the liturgy so that we can lead the people, lead all of us. But it's the work of all of us. You know, I used to say, um, I used to teach high school years ago at a Catholic school. And I'd say, you know, if you, were, if you are bored during the liturgy, it's because you're boring. <laughs> you know, um, there should be no reason why you're bored during the liturgy. You should be praying for the world and gosh, doesn't the world need our prayers right now? Um, you know, praying for all the needs around us. In the liturgy, we have the three major themes of prayer present. And these three, maybe four, depending on how you, how you um, think of it. Um, we should always be praying. We should always, in our daily prayers, remember these, these themes. The first one, the reason I say it's three or four, is uh, praise and or adoration. Sometimes people lump them together. Praise, we can understand as, as you know, thanking God specifically for the goodness um, that he's bestowed upon us. Adoration can be seen more as just kind of adoring God, you know, because he's God. Um, so however you think about it in those terms. But at any rate, we should be you, celebrating in thanksgiving every day for the breath that God has given us, for the life that he has given us. And so when we call we call the liturgy the the fun, central function of the liturgy the Eucharist in Greek ephkaristo is still how you say thank you in Greece in modern Greek when you if you want to thank someone for something it's ephkaristo Eucharist but we also ask forgiveness for our sins and so we say throughout the liturgy Lord have mercy right and we pray the deacon, especially uh, three times during the Divine Liturgy, prays Psalm 50, which we pray during the morning prayer as well. And we ask God for, for what we need, but it's not just about us, right? We are the priestly people of God, and through the church, the world is redeemed, right? The salvation of the world comes through the church, through, through our work in cooperation with God, not our efforts alone. Thank God. But... 
our efforts are really important. I'll talk about that in just a second. So as I said, in every day in our icon corners, in our cars or waiting in line in the store, we should be praying these, these, these various kinds of prayers, praising and glorifying God, asking God for forgiveness for our sins and the sins of the world, uh, and intercession asking for the needs of the world and for our own needs and the needs of our families and so forth. But the liturgy isn't just about us. It's not just our work. It's also, as I said, where God comes and is present among us. Uh, I want to read from St. Simeon of Thessaloniki, who um, wrote several commentaries on the Divine Liturgy that are very beautiful and very important. This is what he says in his explanation of the Divine Temple. Through the holy mysteries, then, Jesus is mingled and mixed with us, and he shines upon us being the sun of righteousness, providing illumination commensurate to the purity. So in the liturgy, God is present in our lives in a very powerful way, in a very tangible, seeable, visible way. And so we offer God back to him, his own from what is his own, right? Here it is in the liturgy text that I've prayed twice this weekend. Beautiful, beautiful prayer. So what are we doing? We're remembering, right? We're motivated by the fact that God loved us so much that he gave us um, himself and, and died on the cross for us. And so listen. Remembering, therefore, this precept of salvation and everything that was done for our sake, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven, the enthronement at the right hand, the second and glorious coming again. So remembering all that God has done for us and what he will do for us at the second coming. We offer you your own from what is your own in all and for the sake of all. And at that point, the deacon is taking the bread and wine that are becoming the body and blood of Christ and making the sign of the cross over the holy table with them. Right? We're offering God back what he's given us, not just the bread and the wine that become his body and blood, but our whole lives. And so, and God shares with us his abundant life. And so we talk about our lives with God as a synergy, as working together. We don't believe that every part of our life is decided already, that our ability to to um, think for ourselves and make decisions, our rational soul, we can um, make decisions in our lives. It's not all pre-planned for us, all decided already. And so, although God is, is infinite and huge, and we are very, very, very small, God loves our part of the equation. You know, just like a little kid putting his hand up um, to into his dad's, you know, he, the dad can lead the kid along uh, without that. But isn't it more beautiful when, when the little you know, kid or grandson or something puts his hand and, and takes um, dads or granddads? Um, and that's for us with God as well. I mean, God can certainly do anything he wants with us. But he loves and respects that the, the, the freedom that he gave us as part of his image, uh, the, the image within us that freedom to choose, um, that reaching out of our hands is, is precious to God. And so in the liturgy, we cooperate with God. In the liturgy, we, um, we reach beyond ourselves to mysteries we cannot possibly understand. And so the liturgy goes beyond us. Um, not only what we see here on earth, the earthly liturgy, but as we sing holy, 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 we sing the hymn of the angels, um, which is the heaven, it goes on in the heavenly liturgy all the time. St. Simeon says this, Such then is the mystery of the sacred service, and this is the consummation of God's becoming human. For through it we become partakers of God, and God's according to grace. And Christ's church has greater and more godly zeal for this. So the goal of our lives, the goal of, of the Christian life is theosis, becoming God, not by nature, by God's grace, by his gift to us. 
And that is what, when uh, Adam and Eve were in the garden, completely open and present to God, um, you know, before they, they discovered they were naked and, and put on skins, put on barriers between themselves and God. We, through the liturgy, slowly start to move ourselves back and we look forward to the day that we are able to be completely once again um, open and imbued with the divine light. St. Simeon says, Therefore the church constantly enacts, this is the liturgy, what it has received from the beginning, and through sacred symbols teaches what is beyond understanding. And even the things that are enacted visibly have participated in such great glory that they are marvelous to all. But the mind of all does not attain to an, an, an understanding of the rites, Therefore, many are at a loss and seek reasons for them. In fact, the rites are beyond all understanding, and no intelligence, either human or angelic, could explain God's incarnation or the manner of communion with God or all that the church proclaims and enacts. And so it's important for us to understand things, but there are some things that are beyond our understanding. And the liturgy touches all of that. And, and, you know, even if we don't completely understand everything, at, the, at least we know we've encountered it. We've encountered the God who was incarnate for us uh, and who suffered and died and who calls us to everlasting life. And so in this month that we celebrate and, and reflect on the divine liturgy, we are thankful to God for all the gifts that he has given us. We are grateful that he has given us this way of not only just understanding up here, but encountering him with our entire being so that we might um, in this life celebrate the kingdom of God and um, orient ourselves toward the kingdom that never ends. Have a great month.